Okay, welcome everybody. <coughs> Um, I'm Misha Jonker, I work for Synopsys and uh, uh, today I would like to tell you something about how to optimize your application uh, in, uh, for, for an embedded uh, processor um, uh, yeah, with the constraints that we see today uh, yeah, with, with, with new embedded architectures. Um, so at first I will tell you a little bit about the uh, yeah, the, the, the things that we are seeing these days uh, in, in the embedded world. Uh, so well, the title of my talk is Fighting Latency. I will tell you a little bit uh, yeah, what that means and how it affects performance. And uh, then we will discuss a little bit uh, what perf is, uh, how we can use this uh, perf tool to identify bottlenecks. Um, after that, uh, we'll dive a little bit more into uh, the concept of prefetching. Of course, I will explain what it is, uh, how you can pre uh, use uh, GCC, uh, the compiler, uh, yeah, to do prefetching automatically. And finally, I will show you uh, the results, so the difference between using prefetching and no prefetching, etc. So let's get started. Um, so processors, um, so what we can see is, you know, the, the, the uh, 20 years ago we, we had, uh, uh, yeah, not a lot of transistors on the CPU and th yeah, th th they were the technology nodes, so, uh, so you hear in the <laughs> uh, things like Intel has, you know, the next generation uh, processors and they are, they are in 22 nanometer or something like that. Um, so that is one way uh, to get these CPUs faster, uh, to decrease uh, t uh, technology nodes, uh, the size of the transistors. So you can put more transistors on there and you can also run them at higher frequencies. Um, another way of uh, making sure that you can execute your programs faster is by splitting each instruction up. So CPU uh, generally executes one instruction at a time, but if you could uh, split one instruction up into uh, multiple stages, pipeline stages, uh, they are called, uh, you, you, can, you have to do a smaller piece of work for every clock cycle, and yeah, by doing less work every clock cycle, uh, you can do more, uh, yeah, you can do decrease the length of every clock cycle. So what you can see here is uh, very old CPUs, for instance, have two pipeline stages. So these are imaginary CPUs, it's just an example. For instance, fetch instruction, execute instruction. So then we go to more recent processors and it's fetch instruction, decode instruction. So what should the instruction do? Then we execute it and then we have result and then we uh, write back the result to the re register file, for instance. And what you can see is um, this graph. So this, this orange line is the, the cycle time. Um, so for really old CPUs, uh, every clock cycle yeah, took, took quite a bit of time. So if you split the uh, workload in several pipeline stages, uh, you can uh, decrease the cycle time. Um, but of course, you need more cycles per instruction sometimes. So this is the purple line. And if you look at the, uh, the green line, you see that there's uh, the, the time per instruction. So this is uh, uh, what you eventually get. Um, and you, you can see there is some speed, sweet spot here in this graph, but it's, again, just an example, at 11, 12 instructions, where the time per instruction is the shortest. Um, so let's have a look how we can uh, uh, Keep, uh, yeah, increase the number of pipeline stages, so increase the, uh, uh, the, the, the clock frequency of your CPU without um, yeah, uh, ending up here, that the time restriction eventually gets longer because you need more cycles to do your instruction. So uh, what could cause the number of cycles per instruction to go up? Um, so for instance, uh, I have a very simpl uh, simpl simplified uh, uh, version of memcopy uh, loop here. Uh, so this is a C program that I compiled to assembly. Uh, just bear with me, sorry <laughs> for the technical details. Um, so what happens, 
so remember we have this long pipeline, so you need to do a fetch, uh, align, decode, uh, execute. And this is the actual pipeline of one of our own uh, CPUs that we designed. Um, so if you're executing this instruction, this is a, a branch back. Yeah? So we do uh, load of the source register, uh, subtract a counter, store to the destination register, and then we increment source and destination pointers, and then branch, if not zero, to one. So as long as uh, R0 here is higher than zero, uh, yeah, we iterate. Um, so it's, if this instruction is executed, usually the next instruction that will be uh, uh, loaded uh, will be the one that is below there, do something else. However, if that happens, uh, then you get a bubble in the pipeline because this is not the, the next instruction that we need to execute. In fact, we need to execute this instruction. Um, so what happens is that, uh, yeah, if, if the processor not notices that uh, it's not, it should not execute this, this instruction, but it should execute this instruction instead, then yeah, we have to start all the way at the beginning again in the, the fetch stage. And then uh, we have here four cycles where the CPU is not doing anything and essentially these cycles are wasted. So that is one form of latency. Um, so in fact, we want to make sure that these uh, stalls, these pipeline stalls where the CPU is doing nothing uh, yeah, we want, would like to prevent these. And by doing that, uh, we want to decrease the cycles per instruction and uh, yeah, uh, uh, move the sweet spot of time per instruction more to the, uh, to the right. So you can have more pipeline stages, uh, less uh, time per cycle, so a higher CPU frequency without, uh, yeah, having to give in on, on performance. Um, so what I just show you is, is uh, re related to branch prediction. Uh, there is another cause of latency, and that is memory latency. And here I've spent <laughs> lots of time, you know, going to Wikipedia to, to, uh, find, uh, to find out what the actual memory latency was of, of different sorts of memories, you know, all the way back into uh, uh, 1980s. <laughs> um, so what you see here, here is, is, is uh, three lines. Uh, we have the purple line. This is the memory latency that's going down. So by uh, creating new uh, technologies of memory, they were able to, to, to decrease the memory latency. But the other two lines are related to uh, uh, the frequencies of the processors that were being used. So for instance, here you have the, 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 uh, the orange line is of actual PC technology, so the, the Intel CPUs, if the IBM PC, uh, 386, uh, 486, Pentium, etc. And then we have another line, uh, because I'm from the embedded technology domain, so the things that you see in uh, phones, tablets, and so on, it's the, the green line. And you see there's, it's lagging behind some six years. Uh, but yeah, the, 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 the curve is essentially the same. Uh, uh, what you see is that the frequency uh, increases faster for CPUs than it does for memories. So the uh, yeah, memory latency becomes a real issue. And this was already the case for uh, you know, your laptop, your PC, and servers. But now it's also the case for uh, mobile phones and uh, embedded technology. So where does this memory latency come from and what can we do about it? So usually what you have is, okay, so you have a CPU and there is, you know, there are some, a couple of transistors that uh, take care of executing instructions. And um, usually they also have uh, caches inside of the CPU, so very close to the execution unit. Uh, instruction cache, data cache, uh, some architectures have uh, yeah, both in one, but this is a Harvard archi architecture. And typically the, the latency uh, from the execution unit to these caches is very low, so one to three cycles. Of course this depends on the architecture that you're using. 
Then there is level two caches, and they are also close to the CPU core. Uh, they are a little bit larger uh, than the L1 caches because these are typically 32K or something. Um, and they are a little bit slower to access. But still, you know, it's, it's kind of okay. <laughs> um, however, once you go beyond level two caches or level three caches, you go to external DDR memory or even hard drives, uh, uh, NAND flash, uh, it becomes a real issue. Uh, so external DDR memory, it depends on the speed, but if your CPU is running at 1.5 gigahertz, it may easily be 100 cycles. So if you have a cache miss and you need to get data for your program all the way from DDR memory, your CPU is doing nothing at all for 100 cycles. And yeah, that's it's not very nice if you're, you've bought a very fast CPU that, that runs at 1.5 gigahertz and essentially it's doing nothing all the, t the half of the time. So that was the introduction on what is latency. Now let's, let's go to uh, this tool called Perf. Um, yeah, so this is me standing in at CERN at uh, you know, the Atlas detector where they detected this Higgs boson. Uh, they used perf to, to uh, optimize uh, all the cores that interpret this, this sensor data. Um, so or originally, perf was uh, called originally uh, performance counters for Linux or PCL, um, and it counts hardware events such as cache misses, uh, TLB misses, pipeline stalls. Um, it can also co count a number of uh, instructions executed or the number of uh, branches executed. This, this depends per CPU. Um, it uses the kernel, the Linux kernel uh, infrastructure, so there is not a lot of overhead and uh, what is also good about it is that uh, you don't need to instrument your program. So you can use any program that you have already compiled and you can use this uh, tool perf uh, you know, to do some profiling, to, to find out uh, so, so some performance characteristi characteristics. Um, so originally it was only hardware events, uh, later on, uh, yeah, uh, it <coughs> became capable of counting more things, and that's when they renamed it to perf events. Uh, here you see what it can count uh, today. So these are these hardware events I just uh, told you about. Then there are software events. Uh, think about context switches or uh, uh, page folds. <laughs> uh, a page fold is you know when you you want to load something from your uh, you want to use something of your program that is not yet in memory, so it needs to be loaded from your hard drive. Um, and last but not least, uh, trace points. And this is yeah very useful. You can use almost anything you want to measure. So for instance, if you want to, to count the number of uh, read system calls, or the, the, uh, you want to, to, to count the number of incoming IP packets in your network stack, you can just put a, a trace point there, and you can really uh, check which part of your program uh, uses the most uh, disk accesses, for instance. Uh, it's very useful. <laughs> But you need root um, uh, root access to, to use this. Okay, so how do we use perf? Uh, you need to have some things uh, installed on your uh, Linux distribution. So if you're using embedded technology, you really need to build your own root file system. But if you're using Ubuntu or something else, you, uh, usually you can just say uh, apt-get install uh, perf tools or something. <laughs> So, um, and this also applies to enabling some com configuration options in the kernel. Uh, yeah, on, on x86 Linux distributions, usually uh, these are enabled by default, so you don't need to, uh, yeah, to bother with this. Um, so it has a command line interface, which is similar to the git tool. So you say perf, uh, command, and then parameters. Um, there is a command line help and there are some manual pages. So usually it's not that difficult uh, uh, to use. Uh, for instance, if you want to uh, you know, just obtain some statistics of a command or a program that you're uh, uh, running, you can just say perf stat from statistics and then the command. So here I do perf stat echo hello world. 
So echo hello world means it needs to start a shell and the shell needs to say uh, to, to put hello world uh, yeah, on the console. So in fact, it's just this is quite a bit more than just uh, doing a printf because you know you also need to uh, start it all up. Uh, what you can see here by default, uh, it's counting a lot of things. It's counting the number of branches, the number of branch misses, the number of cycles, the number of stalled cycles. Uh, you can see it's quite a bit. So it's half of the time it's, it's doing nothing essentially. Uh, yeah, it's quite a waste. <laughs> okay. But however, this is a very uh, simple example. Uh, if you really want to optimize your program, uh, you might want to, uh, yeah, to do some profiling and store all the data that comes out of this profiling action and then do some analysis uh, after you have done profiling. Uh, for this, you can use the perf record command. Uh, so I've made a very small C program, which I will show you later on, uh, that just does uh, memory copy. I've called it copy. <laughs> um, so, yeah, to, to get the profiling data, you say perf record and then copy. Um, and then it will capture uh, samples and we'll store them in a, a file called perf.data. Um, and then you can say perf report and you get, uh, uh, depending on what kind of user interface you have, you can get either this uh, text report or you can use a uh, which is also you know not graphically but there, it's a user interface you can get this uh, uh, kind of uh, display if you redirect it uh, perf will see that you redirect it to a file and will always generate this uh, text file so what you can see here is that 99 percent of the time um, yeah it's in uh, a symbol called main so it was in the main function um, so what you saw here is uh, a couple of warnings. Warning, kernel address maps are restricted. Uh, check, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so I'm running this as a, as a regular user. So I can, uh, yeah, it, I have access to the uh, profiling data within uh, this copy command. However, while running this command, uh, sometimes uh, the kernel also needs to do uh, things. Uh, for instance, if you are in a system call, uh, yeah, you can transfer control to the kernel without doing a task switch. And this, the same thing applies if you have uh, page faults. Uh, you also switch to, switch to kernel mode and you switch back to user space mode. And you cannot really uh, know what is happening inside the kernel uh, without using this command. <laughs> uh, of course, you need to do this as, you, as root. And by this, you uh, give some more um, uh, more permissions to the to the program, so that you can in fact uh, see that uh, yeah when it's in the kernel what it's doing. So for instance, here you see it's 99%. Sorry, it's, that it's red on, on on black. It's not very clear. 99% uh, in this copy command in the main function. The rest of the time, it's uh, yeah in some kernel functions. Um, and uh, this is uh, the actual user interface that you have. So, if you would like to do, uh, if you would like to see what, it, what, what, what where the cycles are being spent, you can click on this. Uh, uh, yes, it's a text-based user interface. You can press enter, and you say annotate main, and then you get a, a disassembly listing. And well, again, it's not a very good contrast here, but. Uh, essentially, most time is spent in these two instructions, and this is a little bit deceiving because uh, this, these are uh, x86 instructions, so they are on the Intel core, which is super scalar architecture, and it issues multiple instructions per cycle. So, in fact, you're not sure if it's uh, spending some time here or here or here, uh, but it's in this area, so it may, maybe one or two instructions off. Okay, so this is not really uh, clear to see because this was compiled with minus 03, so with all the optimizations enabled and with no debugging symbols. So you saw that everything was spent in the main function, but in fact, uh, in my test program, which I will show later on, 
uh, yeah, there were multiple functions, but these were all being inlined. So uh, yeah, so it, 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 it's it's the most optimal uh, uh, to do, but it's not very clear if you want to optimize it or debug it for for that matter. So uh, if you use this. It becomes intrusive, but it becomes more clear what you're doing. And here you can see that in this particular uh, C function or C statement, destination i is source i. Uh, yeah, I'm spending most cycles. Um, okay, so by default, perf measures. Uh, the cycle event, and it does so at a sampling frequency of four kilohertz. And so it tries to uh, determine how many cycles go into four, uh, uh, one four thousandth of a second, and uh, that is the interval that it uses. So for every one millionth cycle, it will. Uh, trigger and then store the program counter and that is what ends up in the in the profile data and this one million or get, get automatically gets adjusted uh, so that it makes sure that there are uh, x cycles in this interval um, so by default we were counting cycles However, I have the feeling that this is a very memory intensive uh, program, a memcopy. And in fact, uh, I think that a lot of the cycles that we are spending are caused by cache misses. So this, this is because I know a little bit about how my program works and, uh, so, uh, and I would like to optimize these things. So if you do perf list, you see it here on the background, there are a lot of events that you can count, uh, software events, uh, hardware events and hardware cache events and one of those is the L1 dcache load misses event so level 1 data cache uh, load misses so what I will do next is uh, uh, I will count um, uh, the data cache uh, misses uh, by specifying uh, the, 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 the event that I want to count. So it, instead of counting s cycles, it will now uh, record the, uh, the program counter for every data cache miss or every n, the nth data cache miss. So if we do that, you see that there is one single instruction that uh, is responsible for an 80%, 81.13% of the uh, data cache misses. And then we say, hey, this is a nice candidate for optimizing. Um, how are we going to optimize this? So, prefetching. <laughs> Let me first discuss a little bit what prefetching is before I show you how we can uh, uh, yeah, use it uh, uh, to help us. So, what we have here is um, yeah, uh, four networking benchmarks. Uh, that I've run on a simulation with a, uh, yeah, on this simulation I was able to, to change the memory latency from w zero to 200 cycles and uh, measure it. Um, I have two benchmarks that are really CPU intensive that do a lot of calculation but don't use a lot of memory. This is the shortest path find uh, benchmark, it's the green line and the red line is the uh, root lookup benchmark, these two. And you can see, okay, they, they degrade a little bit if you go to a high memory latency, but in fact, the performance is almost the same across the, the latencies that there are. Um, but there are two other benchmarks, uh, network address translation, which basically does what, what your uh, Wi-Fi router in your home does. So it just changes your packet a little bit. So uh, yeah, it ends up that uh, you can have multiple computers using the same uh, external IP address. And there's another one, IP reassembly, uh, yeah, which uh, if you have a, uh, this is really the old ages when you had these modems and you had uh, <laughs> a TCP IP packets of, what is it, max MTU, 200, 300 bytes, I don't know. <laughs> and so, so these were split up and at the end you, you could reassemble them again so you get one big IP packet. 
And this is also, of course, a memory intensive benchmark. And you see if you have a memory intensive benchmark, um, the initial performance and zero cycle latencies, uh, yeah, it decreases a lot if you uh, add latency. And um, so at 75 cycles latency, which is kind of typical, uh, yeah, you're at only a half the performance as the initial performance. So 50% of the time you're doing nothing, essentially. So how can we, yeah, okay, so this is mem copy. This is even worse, right? Because it's only doing memory transfers. So then at 75% latency, uh, you're, you're only have one third of your in initial performance left. So what happens? Uh, mem, mem copy does a load and then store, load, store, load, store. And every time you have, uh, uh, yeah, one, the, you go to the next data cache line, uh, it, it, you will have a, uh, you can have a cache miss, and then, uh, yeah, your CPU will wait uh, before, uh, yeah, wait until the data cache is filled up with uh, a contents from the memory again. And I'm just painting here uh, six stalls, but in fact, it's uh, it's a lot more. And it's not only for loads; it's also for stores. But we'll get to that later on. Um, so what is prefetching? So for instance, if we do load store, load store, etc., cetera, um, yeah, you, get, you end up with, with, with these stalls. During these stalls, uh, one cache line in the data cache is being refilled from memory. Um, if you, if for instance, have an additional instruction called a prefetch instruction, which exists on most architectures, then when you do a load of address zero, you can already uh, say prefetch uh, for the next cache line. So while you are uh, doing the copy of uh, this particular cache line, in the background, your data cache is already fetching uh, memory for, for the next iteration. So that is what you see here. So, and then all these stalls are in fact moved and they are on the background here, so they are hidden, so you, they don't bother you. Um, so what I've just sh shown you is using a prefetch instruction. Uh, that is more of a software approach. Uh, there's also hardware uh, that can automatically do prefetching. So for instance, most desktop CPUs, um, yeah, they will automatically they, they, they will try to detect patterns, right? So if you have a lot of sequential reads or stores, they just think, okay, I see a pattern. You, you just want uh, the next stuff. <laughs> and uh, yeah, by doing that, uh, it will just prefetch in, in the background. But of course, this costs quite a bit of power because you don't know uh, upfront if you are really going to need that. And aside from that, um, uh, it takes a while before the CPU uh, yeah, recognizes the pattern uh, and only after it has recognized the pattern it can really do this automatic prefetching. So then there is compiler assisted prefetching which I will show you uh, talk a little bit about later on. Uh, so this happens when you're, uh, yeah, you supply your compiler with uh, so some extra uh, uh, options and by using, uh, yeah, by analyzing static anal analysis of your uh, uh, program, it tries to, to, to identify loops of uh, yeah, memory accesses, and then it will automatically uh, you know, put some prefetch instructions in between uh, if it thinks it's useful. And then there is uh, manually inserting prefetch instructions, and this is where the perf tool helps you. Uh, so if you find a lot of data cache misses using this perf tool, you know, okay, maybe you can here uh, use uh, yeah, some of these uh, prefetch instructions and you just tell uh, your compiler, okay, I want to prefetch this particular pointer. Okay, so how does this look like? This is my very simple program. It indeed does a mem copy. I do it with words and not with bytes, uh, but you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's the same example. And if I just compile this with minus 03, maximum optimization, I end up with, end up with this in, uh, 
uh, assembly. So this is a zero overhead loop where we load uh, one register and then we store the same register to the other memory location. And these two, two instructions are iterated for the whole loop. Um, however, if we add this particular uh, option, minus F prefetch loop arrays, uh, GCC will analyze uh, the loops like I told you before and insert prefetch instructions. Now you, you end up with a lot more code as you can see, but in fact the number of iterations is a little bit shorter. Um, so at the beginning we have some loop setup code um, and then we have an unrolled loop that does the mem copy and in fact it is unrolled in such a way that every iteration uh, does a mem copy of one uh, cache line and you can see here that uh, yeah it's prefetching 100 bytes ahead and then we go to the later part of the loop uh, so it will only uh, use this unrolled loop uh, yeah, for the first part of your mem copy for the last 100 bytes it will uh, refer back to the uh, to this copy uh, loop that, that we sh we've shown you earlier when we compiled without the prefetch loop arrays option uh, this is because uh, yeah, so if you are at the last 100 bytes, you don't need to prefetch again because then you would be prefetching beyond your uh, the, the uh, contents that you want to copy. So we need to tune this option a little bit to make sure that uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, applicable uh, for our uh, architecture. Uh, so these are the defaults that uh, GCC is using. So uh, there are some parameters to, to, uh, for the prefetch latency. So this is in fact, uh, uh, yeah, it, it's about uh, the memory latency. Then there's the simultaneous prefetches. So you saw that, that we only had a prefetch instruction here for, uh, for the loads uh, and not for the stores. So in fact, this is because I'm only able to do uh, three simultaneous prefetches and uh, yeah, the latency is 200 instructions. So it, it, it calculates that yeah, there will be already three simultaneous prefetches uh, running uh, yeah, in, 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 the, in the read loop. So it doesn't make sense to add more uh, instructions. Well, L1 cache size, L1 cache line size, they speak for themselves. Um, yeah, so in order to, to pass this to, to GCC, you just use dash dash param and then uh, the name of the parameter as is uh, and then uh, the, the value that you want to use. Um, so I told you it's not only about loads, it's also about stores. So what happens on some architectures when you store data and the data is not yet in the cache? So here I've tried to make an image of a, of a very simple cache that is 16 byte line size. So for instance, um, you want to store uh, to this particular address. So it ends with 1.4, so it will uh, select uh, this index in the cache, uh, where all the addresses end with uh, one something, 1.4, uh, one eight, one C, it's all in the same cache line. Um, so in order to, uh, to store something there, you want to store it to the cache, but you also want to, uh, yeah, to make sure that, so if you only store this value, uh, you have to make sure that this, this, this other data is, is also correct. And uh, for that, you need to load the other data uh, into the cache before you can override one single value in the cache line with the uh, data you have uh, from the register. So, and if you have still some data already in the cache on this particular cache line that is dirty, so it's not yet in the main memory, it's only in the cache, you need to, to do an evict to write back the old data. So this is called a write back cache. And so you have to do a lot of things. Um, you have to uh, 
allocate the cache line, write back the old data, then load uh, the uh, data for the new cache line from memory, and then write the value uh, in the cache line. So if you, if you only start with doing all these steps, uh, when you're at the moment uh, of, of writing stuff uh, to the cache, then you're quite late because you need to do all these steps. And of course, there are some advanced architectures that can do a lot of this in parallel and uh, you know keep track that, okay, I have this, this written this data and I need to combine it later on with other data from memory. But it's not the case for all embedded architectures. And yeah, so th this can add a lot uh, of co uh, complexity and, and latency to your program as well. So if I change this parameter, simultaneous prefetches from three to eight, you can see it will also prefetch uh, the load and the store. Okay, so other ways to do prefetching. Um, there is a, a, a GCC uh, built-in. Uh, it's called built-in prefetch. So it's basically uh, so some, some function that you can call. So if you know, okay, this particular point in my program, I will need to use it uh, within 100 instructions. Uh, you can already say, uh, start prefetching it. Or if you add uh, comma one, you can say, okay, I, I want to write to, this, uh, to the location of this particular pointer uh, in 100 instructions. And a nice thing about this build-in is that the, the pointer is allowed to be null. Uh, so if you call a function with a pointer and you, have, you, you don't need to check the pointer if it's okay or not, you can already say uh, uh, start prefetching and then you can do some checks whether you actually need to write or read or not. And uh, when you're at the point that you actually need to do something with the contents that the pointer is pointing to, uh, yeah, the data is already inside the cache. So yeah, you will have a, a, a lot higher performance. It's also used in the kernel quite a bit. Uh, in the memory allocator, RCU trees. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure if any one of you is doing Linux drivers. Uh, it is important that when you do DMA, uh, that you don't prefetch uh, too much, uh, but it's kind of <laughs> even more technical detail. <laughs> so uh, in, in inside the MIPS tree, there is a whole uh, explanation of this. So I'll uh, just point you to that uh, if you want to know more details. Um, the hardware prefetching should be transparent, uh, but of course this is also, it needs uh, uh, I.O. coherent architecture uh, in order to be useful. So I've done some simulations to show, show you what kind of uh, speed improvements you can get. And this is done with a model and I've tried to keep it a, keep it a little bit simple. Uh, so we have uh, three lines. Uh, the original performance without prefetching, so you see that you know, with increasing cycles latency, the performance drops quite quickly. And then we have the orange line uh, with hardware prefetching. So that's the kind of prefetching that first, um, yeah, tries to, uh, and, uh, to, to discover a pattern in the memory accesses and then uh, starts to prefetch ahead. And then we have the software uh, prefetching, which is just a prefetch instruction that every, for every loop it goes uh, 512 bytes ahead. And you see that that is in fact the most, um, uh, yeah, the most useful uh, way of doing it uh, for this particular simulation. It doesn't apply to all use cases maybe. Um, and you also see that even at zero cycles latency, uh, these two are quicker. And that's because refilling a cache line always takes uh, time, even if the memory is instantaneous, yeah, depending on the uh, bus width, you need to spend a couple of uh, cycles to get data from the memory into your cache. And uh, last but not least, um, in the beginning I also told you about these uh, branches. Uh, so the longer your pipeline gets, 
uh, the more expensive it becomes if uh, a branch is mispredicted. So this happens, for instance, if you have an if statement, and uh, yeah, uh, the, the 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 outcome of the if statement varies a lot with. Uh, so, so, so the processor is not uh, very good at uh, predicting what the outcome of the if statement will be. And uh, yeah, if, it, if the processor doesn't know uh, yeah, what the outcome will be, uh, there will be a lot of missed predictions and you spend a lot of cycles doing nothing. So you can help the CPU a little bit uh, by using uh, these keywords. In fact, this is the GCC built-in that you can use for it but it's a little bit complicated to use. So the Linux kernel defines these macros, likely and unlikely. And so you can just say, if likely, uh, team brackets, x is three, uh, do this or do that. And uh, by using uh, uh, these, these, these uh, macros, uh, the compiler will schedule the code in such a way that uh, the likely path will, will be predicted and the unlikely path will, uh, yeah, will be predicted that it's not being executed. So uh, in that way, you can reduce the, the cycles of penalty you have there. Class. Have you ever tried how much this affects performance? You have to be very careful. <laughs> but yes, um, we are developing a new CPU uh, generation, and uh, I know this affects uh, it quite a bit. You try to use CoreMark and... Uh <laughs> because I did a little bit. Yeah. I quickly realized that branch mispredictions predictions are somewhere between the second and the third order less than the correct predictions. So less than a percent of branches are mispredicted. This differs a lot between architectures, right? Okay. So if you have a very complicated, complicated branch predictor, and uh, so if you're using, for instance, ARM Cortex-A something uh, uh, CPUs, in fact, these are super scalar. So what they uh, usually do is, if you have a branch, they will execute both the likely and the unlikely path. And then, you know, they have already done some things in, for, for the unlikely path as well. So the penalty is not so, so much as if you have only one execution unit and a very small core. And we sell very small cores, <laughs> you guessed it. And we also try to increase speeds and late uh, pipeline stages. So we, we run into, in the, into these kind of issues and uh, this, this helps quite a lot for us. But I have to say I ran a little bit out of time to get some quantitative data on this. But I do know that uh, yeah, we have changed the compiler quite a bit for our new processor architecture to make sure that uh, it performs well. Um, yeah, so. Uh, here's another uh, warning. So that, that this is why you should use the, the likely and unlikely. Um, this built-in expect macro, uh, what it does is it, it says, okay, I expect X to be Y, for instance. So if you say likely, I expect X to be true, you compare it with one. However, uh, true is any value that is not zero. So uh, this is why we use the double uh, exclamation marks. So uh, by this we, we make sure that x is either 0 or 1 and not something else. And this is indeed what class is referring to, <laughs> maybe. Uh, according to the GNU programmers, uh, programmers are uh, notoriously bad at thinking, at, at predicting how, what the, the outcome of a branch. So uh, yeah really make sure that when you add these kind of things uh, that you're actually, it is indeed more likely or unlikely uh, than, than the default, that you really uh, see some uh, cycles being uh, thrown away at this particular if statement. Uh, in other words, don't make things worse. That's uh, important. I have a small question. How does this uh, affect optimization without three for example, I mean... Yeah, so what usually happens, uh, GCC uh, expects that the likely path is uh, yeah, uh, going through, so uh, the likely path is don't branch. So it doesn't really affect optimization, it, it affects the ordering of instructions. And uh, so you shouldn't have more instructions by using these things, but uh, yeah, it really depends on the scheduler uh, per architecture. But for Intel, I think it's uh, the, the, the likely path is also always 
the lot branch and, and just go through. So it will put the, the unlikely path, it will put something at the end of the function. Does it answer your question? Yeah, more or less. Okay. Okay, so I'm almost at the end of the presentation. I have a lot more things to talk about, but uh, you can also see it on the internet. Um, this is a very good paper about uh, uh, optimizing, in this case it's a, a 2D uh, drawing library uh, for ARM. And this is a blog entry that explains a little bit about this likely and unlikely. Uh, here on the background you see a so-called flame graph. That's a very nice uh, way of visualizing the data that comes out of this perf record tool. And last but not least, I've been porting uh, perf support in the kernel to our Arc architecture. <laughs> and it's on GitHub and I'm planning to push it, but I haven't had the time to get it upstream yet. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, last but not least, uh, the numbers tell the tale, or in other words, Maiten is waiting. Please make sure that what you're optimizing is the correct thing to optimize. Uh, yeah, use perf and you will see where your cycles are being spent. And yeah, I think with 20% of the optimizations you can gain 80% of the time. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> thought so. <laughs> yes, please. Do you have a way for uh, actually using a line in CPU cache as a pipeline talking between, for example, two processes or two threads? Uh, so, sorry, what do you mean? Uh, well, uh, is it possible, for example, if you control fully the architecture of the CPU, etc., yeah. uh, is it possible for you to also allocate maybe 8K? Of the, let's say, L1 cache, not as a data store, not as a register, but actually for the, for the pipeline, for inter process communication. The two processes start attaching to it and then talk to each other. Yeah, so there, there are ways to, um, uh, in, in some processor architectures, you can say, okay, I don't want to use these uh, particular cache lines uh, as a data cache, but you can uh, 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 allocate them to a uh, tightly coupled data memory, for instance. And then if you have a, a DMI interface on the uh, outside of the core, you can have other cores uh, yeah, doing DMA or talking to that particular memory as well. But that really depends on the on the processor. Is that what you mean or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so it, it depends on the processor architecture. But yes, that, that's of course possible. And then you can do even better mem copies because you can just say, okay, uh, DMA engine, uh, copy this piece of uh, DDR memory into this DCCM and then uh, I, I, will, I will do something else. Of course that's possible, but it's a little bit hard to make generic, uh, yeah. But of course we do these kind of tricks in our audio codecs. <laughs> yeah, on, uh, on X, uh, X86, yeah. you would of course use, uh, for a very large RAM copy, non-temporal stores to write directly to DRAM. Uh, yeah, and I think uh, the ARM architecture switches from uh, write allocate caches to uh, no write allocate uh, caches after a couple of cache lines. It will just write to memory. So again, this, this really depends on, on, uh, on your architecture. Uh, for, for instance, on MIPS, this is not the case. It's uh, quite a disaster. <laughs> Klaas, you had a question? Can you go back to slide 14? This one? Uh, the next one. Oh, uh, sorry, six, and I now realize that you did answer. So the instruction that is causing the trip problem is move. Ah, yes, of course. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry for that. But yeah, then again, this is super scalar. So I, I couldn't really make sense of it myself. I think it is around this instruction that it's stalling uh, because it's doing. Explain afterwards that this is the right cache that is uh, causing the penalty. So you can indeed explain this way this moment. Okay, <laughs> thanks. But this effect, the red instruction is allowed. Yeah, so, so the, the Intel is notoriously difficult at this because they swap the destination and source the other way around, right? No. 
<laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Oké, okay, anyone else? Oké, okay, thanks very much again.